Welcome to 39 Minute Conversations. Please wait for your host to begin this meeting. Your meeting is now being recorded. Okay, are you there? Can you see me? Can you hear me? I can see you and I can hear you. How are you? I am doing well. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well, man. Uh, thank you for being here. I'm excited to talk to you. Um, the first thing I do have to do is get through a quick intro and ad read. I hope that's cool on of your course. end. Okay, perfect. I, uh, I'm, I might read along with you just from memory. Oh yeah, go for it. Like if, like pick it, pick it up, like uh, sing along. It's great. Um, hello, I am Brian T. Arnold, and this is 39 Minute Conversations, a podcast about reconnecting with old friends and making new ones. But I've only got 39 minutes to do it because I will not be paying for Zoom Pro. This week's episode is not technically presented by the PlayStation 5. Sony's PlayStation 5 is top of the line in graphics and gameplay, featuring exciting games like Elden Ring, God of War Ragnarok, Last of Us Parts 1 and 2, games that I have not gotten to play because I don't have a PlayStation 5. I'm stuck playing PlayStation 4 like an Amish person or something. And here's the deal. Sony, I, I'm giving you some free advertising and I think it'd only be fair to send me a PlayStation 5. If everyone listening buys one, you know, which I'm encouraging them to do, go buy a PlayStation 5. It'd only be right to send one my way. And I know for a fact that podcasters get free shit sometimes, meal plans and Pelotons and whatnot. And I know this is a fairly new uh, podcast, fairly small podcast, but it's not unprecedented. I've gotten some free stuff before. Recently, I had the honor and privilege of watching the screener for a new movie before it was released in theaters and on demand, a movie called The Donor Party, a comedy about a single woman who desperately wants to become a mother so she and her friends plan to pull off the ultimate sperm heist from a few unsuspecting donors, starring Malin Ackerman, Aaron Hayes, Bria Henderson, Rob Corddry, Ryan Hansen, Patty Guggenheim, Cedric Yarborough, Jerry O'Connell, and so many more very funny people. The Donor Party is out now in theaters and on demand, and fun fact, The Donor Party was written and directed by my guest today, Tom Harp. Tom, hello. Hey, thank you. That was great. Oh, thank you. I had fun with those. I switched it up a little bit today. Usually I do the ad first, but I was like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to do, we're just going to segue right from ad into movie. Like, let's try something new. Perfect. It was great. Thank you. This is, uh, this is a kind of rare episode for the podcast in that, you know, mostly it's people that, I, I have I interview people that I've kind of known in the world before, you know, before I kind of went into my isolation cave. And this is the first time we've interacted outside of a Twitter, Twitter. DM. Yeah. So um, I appreciate you being here. It's very nice to meet you. Thank you so much for having me. And it's a real pleasure. I hope we actually do get to get you out of your your <laughs> embryonic shell and, yeah. and out into the world so that we can hang out. You sound like every person who knows and loves me, and I haven't listened to them yet, but I will uh, I will try to do better. Um, before we get into the movie and your and your story, which I am excited to talk about, I usually do start these episodes with some mild pandemic talk because I, I don't know how to relate to people anymore without that context. Um, how have the last three or so years been on your end? How did they change you if they did? What have you learned about yourself? Walk me through your experience the last few years. So the pandemic, it's a it's a it's a tough one for me to totally quantify because I had to watch it through the lens of I I got married really young um mm -hmm. and had kids pretty much right away. My wife is a dermatologist and she you know, we looked at each other and we're like, you know, there's never gonna be a really good time to have kids because mm -hmm. if you wait till she's done with her you know med school then she's got an intern year and then you know her residency and then you know you're, you're starting your work mm. by that time there's like 12 years and she said I just would rather start now and if you're willing to raise the kids yeah then we can do it so that's what that's what I did and um and while the kids were in the very you know when they were very young well, they slept, I would write. So I got mm. really good at doing 45 minute or an hour power writing. Mm. Um, 
But then when they went to school, it was great. And I could screw around on the internet. Um, <laughs> so, um, so then we had, uh, so watching the pandemic through their eyes, that was really tough. Mm -hmm. um, How I old had, are your kids? My kids are now, I mean, they're, they're older now. Uh, they are 22, 19 and 16. Okay. So I saw a kid. So I had one who had just started college. Mm -hmm. and came home for spring break and didn't go back yeah that was tough um then the the other one had you know all of the senior year kind of get ruined by it mm -hmm. so all of the rites of passage that we kind of take for granted and maybe we make fun of prom or whatever but we had their, the option of going to prom. Yeah, they're seminal moments. Like whether you go or not, it's that's a choice and a moment you remember. Exactly. So watching it through their eyes and then, you know, middle school, I actually told my my youngest, I was like, you know what? You didn't miss anything. Middle school is horrible. <laughs> I'm, if I could have not gone to middle school, it would have been fantastic. Yeah. You're in great shape. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the one kid who's going to come out of this like super well adjusted. Yeah, exactly. Because, like, yeah, oh, I don't have school. any of the drama from middle school. It's fantastic. <laughs> we'll never um, be able to relate to a single John Hughes movie, but that's okay. That's um, okay. Um I don't know. That's we got to experience the the crap to love John Hughes. So I don't know. That's a that is a wash. That's a little tougher. Yeah. Um, so, but you know, for that, that was the thing watching them on a personal level, I got really lucky. We were, um, two weeks before the pandemic started, I was hired to, or we can, I was hired before this, but we convened a writer's room to do this podcast with mm -hmm. Rain Wilson and, um, and Aaron Lee, who is, uh, writer on, um, the Cleveland show and, and, showrunner of a bunch of animated shows on Netflix and just you know he's super brilliant really funny guy and we were hired to write this insane podcast called Dark Air with Terry Carnation which inside the the podcast acts almost like a book on tape that he's reading but then you mm -hmm. hear the person recording the book on tape interact with him and then it goes into reenact I mean we break all the rules yeah the whole thing Two weeks before the pandemic, we had our, our first writer's room meeting and, and it was great. We were t pitching out ideas and then the pandemic hit and I was um, brought on not only to to write, but also to produce it because I had worked with a lot of um, folks from the Groundlings and UCB mm -hmm. um, on my Funny or Die stuff. And so they, you know, Rain calls in ringers like Tom Lennon. Mm -hmm. you know to do stuff or the folks that he knows from the office or Yvette Nicole Brown or any of those folks mm -hmm. and I'm like I want to get Karin Sony I want mm -hmm. Karin Sony to play your sidekick because he's the greatest mm -hmm. and so we were able to do that and put that all together so that kind of kept me busy for a year yeah um making that it was fantastic it was a great distraction because we did it all over zoom this mic is kind of from that <laughs> so, sure um so we did that and and then while that was happening, before that, I had these two movies, Home Delivery and um, Donor Party, mm -hmm. both had producers and both were out to people. And because they are, I wrote them to be very cheap to make mm -hmm. because that was the only way that I would be able to direct them. Sure. Um, and it turns out that one of the parameters that I that I used for that was to limit the locations. Right. Because of that, they were very pandemic friendly. Mm -hmm. um, so even though they started, we started putting them together beforehand, they were really helped in a weird way by the pandemic. So that was the silver lining sure. of, of that. But it was miserable being I mean it was wonderful being on set, but it was miserable always having like I have so many behind the scenes photos. Mm -hmm can't see my face so it's sure. just like oh there's a bald white guy directing it could be tom <laughs> could, could be bruce willis we have no idea like just any <laughs> you have no idea sure um so that's 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 a little so it's a really mixed bag on a personal level it was really hard to watch my kids go through the the pain mm -hmm. um but as writers as you know like unless you you're a tv writer you're used to writing on your own mm -hmm. um so it was kind of like just I just didn't have a choice but to be on my own. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I, I I totally relate to that because yeah, I also as a writer, you know, I'm 
inside most of the time before like that that's how I spend my days but I would always have um other like in the nights I would do it sound so some I freeze up so weird let me tell you in the nights what I would do um no I at night I would go to like I would do a lot of UCB uh, comedy shows and and I would at IO West and different places and that all all went away uh, oh, during yeah. and even before the pandemic. So I yeah, so now it's starting to come back. I haven't really gotten back into that world. You you were directing stuff at Funny or Die and you so because of that, you had these connections. Uh, did how did you end up working at the at Funny or Die or making stuff for Funny or Die and get those connect? Is that how you got those UCB connections or were you connected? Yeah, so. Well, the first one, I, I, you know, again, I credit Rain. Rain Wilson has, he, we're friends and he's a giant supporter. Um, but he, you know, I pitched an idea. F- he had this thing that still exists called Soul Pancake um, mm-hmm. that I think participant bought. Um, but Soul Pancake was doing these really uplifting shows. And I got this crazy idea for a web series where you would go and interview people who were like the totally unsung heroes or the, like, the artist who wanted to be a major artist, but it ended up being the police sketch artist, you know, those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. And we shot a pilot um, about a fortune cookie writer who <laughs> was miserable. And I just thought that was really funny. And we got uh, Randall Park to do it. And mm-hmm. so I pitched I pitched this series to, to Rain. They financed that first one. That... Um, and we made that and I worked with Randall. And then through that, I used that and introduced it to the folks over at, at Funny or Die. Mm-hmm. And they were like, hey, listen, if you have ideas, come pitch them to us. And if we like them, we'll make them. So I was never a staff person there. Sure. It was like a featured contributor. Um, but I got to work with a lot of great people through that. Mm-hmm. And um, and 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 it was wonderful. And I go, you know, I it's not like I go to Groundlings all the time. Um, but I love going to the Groundling shows. I, I'm, I love going to UCB shows. I got in trouble because I brought my kids to a, mm-hmm. an Ask Cat show. And <laughs> when they were like 11 and 15. Was, sure. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's, uh, that's just part of my DNA. So I love mm-hmm. sketch work. And I, and, and I think that that was one of the things that I really wanted to, uh, to do because it was something I could make. I mm-hmm. had a lot of things get optioned and not get made. Mm. Um, and that was heartbreaking, you sure. know, um, as you know, like you can, you can have a lot of, you can have a script that everyone in town wants to have a meeting with you for. And, and I'm like, did you just buy it and right. make it, you know, like, yeah. or, you know, and, and it was flattering to get the options, but it's not the same at all. Um, yeah. So making something finally was mm-hmm. like, just, it was a life raft for me. You know, I, I think it's how it got, I got through a couple tough years where I thought my reps thought I had a really solid script. We thought, you know, I got written up on like the heat list or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, nothing. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think that's a journey. A lot of us kind of go through and even the people like a screenwriting career more so than I think acting more so than directing more so than most things in this, in this industry, you can have like a level of success, even financial success to like enough to stay alive and never have a thing made or rarely get a thing made. And it's just such a weird, you know, having to answer that question of when's that movie coming out? Like, I would also like to know Uh, (laughs) that would be, that would be great. Um, So like, yeah, I have like, talk to my reps and am and, and trying to figure out how to, you know, work my way toward, you know, directing my own stuff. Cause I think at a certain point that is like what you've done and what other people do and to get that level of control and as hard as it is to get something made even then. But um, so what advice would you have for a hypothetical uh, wannabe director, let's call him Brian, who wants to get to that point in their career where they are like, you know, I'm, I'm directing my own script. Like what, what, what would, what path would you tell them to, to take? Well, you know, this was actually the thing and I, I'm going to do a little bit of memory lane stuff to get there because it's important. Um, when I was a DP, one of the people that I met, cause I was up in Seattle, my wife was at med school up, up at the university of Washington mm-hmm. and I met Lynn Shelton and she was an editor for hire and I <laughs> was a DP for hire. 
and we worked on something together, an ad, and it was, and we just hit it off. Our kids are the same age. It, you know, like there was just a, a really strong bond. And and I, and and I ended up shooting a couple of her early short films, and then mm. she edited a couple of my early short films. Um, and then I had a script get optioned, mm -hmm. and you know, I had a writing partner at the time, and it was, and so I, I thought, and I was getting requests for for generals and and I thought okay well this is now the time to move um I had a manager I had a script I had all that kind of stuff and then it didn't happen mm -hmm. but I moved us down down here um and did those meetings and it was great and in the meantime Lynn made hump day mm -hmm. and I said and I was like listen I'm gonna take you out to the nicest lunch and I just need to pick your brain and it, like, how did you do it? Mm -hmm. well, what was the path? And she said that the keys, and so this is where I get to the the nugget. So this is all Lynn Shelton. This mm -hmm. is not Tom Harp. Okay. The keys were limit your locations because location moves will kill you. Mm -hmm. um, like do a location a day so that you only are packing in and, and loading out once. Um, mm -hmm. And if you can make something a home base for a while, that's that's even better because then you don't have to wrap at night. You just kind of leave it hot and come back the next day and get more done. So limit your locations, limit your um, screen time. And I don't mean like running time. I mean, like takes place over the course of a day, takes place over the course of two days tops was what she said. And the reason, because then you don't have to monitor costume changes. You don't have to monitor mm -hmm. hair changes as much. You 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 really... You're condensing the time frame so you don't lose time to people having to leave set and get changed and all that kind of stuff. So those two things. And then the most important thing that she said, which is weird to explain, is you have to lean into your strengths. Mm -hmm. So if your strengths are quiet, contemplative moments or really strong character work, then that's what you lean into. If your strengths are dialogue, then lean into that. Make it so that it's like just punchy and fun and and all that. If it's comedy, lean into that. She's like, if your strengths are stunts, then you probably are not making this kind of movie. <laughs> um, sure. But you can't, you know, you if if you know how to do smart, cheap stunts and can work with a great stunt team, whatever is your strength, lean into your strength. Mm -hmm. And I took those to heart and I wrote um, this thing called Home Delivery. Mm -hmm. It was the first one I wrote with that sort of model. And right when I was getting, it wasn't the, the, the script that got optioned was not the script that got me my agent. Um, it was another script, okay. a subsequent script. Um, and I, while that was getting shopped around and all this stuff, I wrote Home Delivery with the intention of, of, directing it like mm -hmm. if you can make it cheap enough then you can direct it um so i came to the agency and i was like here's the one that you like that you can mm -hmm. sell for a lot of money and here's one that i want like, <laughs> that i eventually <laughs> would like to to direct um, yeah. and they were they loved both of them and they tried to get both of them made um to their credit it's you know a real i i'm so happy at gersh and i'm so happy with the the team that i have um and then, you know, that, but still it was, I was the boat anchor that couldn't mm -hmm. get, we had a really good place it was set up and it wasn't happening. So then I was like, okay, I got to write something even cheaper. So instead of it taking sure. place over the course of two days, I'm going to have it take place over the course of one night or, mm -hmm. you know, sort of a little bit in a preamble right. and then one night to do the whole rest of thing in one place so that we right. can own it. And I can do a lot of stuff there. And that I wrote um in 2018 okay and um and it got and then i started sending it out and and sent it to some people i'd met on generals and and two producers uh ross Cohn and nancy Leparty fell in love with it and they were like we can see a path forward we know how to get this made we just have mm -hmm. to get like the right person in the lead and that was really you know and then the covet happened but it ended up being Unlike some of their other projects that were bigger or had stunts or whatever, this was mm -hmm. actually something manageable. So that's, they were able to hone in and we were able to get that done. Um, mm -hmm. 
and and at the same time home delivery had gone this long circuitous route where there's someone who had seen who had been an employee at another production company that had been submitted to who fell in love with it but couldn't get it made there mm -hmm. or it didn't get made there and when he left the company to start his own company he called my agent and said listen is home delivery available and my agent said he literally was like let me see <laughs> yeah it looks like it's available sure. like, but he was so excited because they they've always been in love with that script and so it both of them happening because of, because they were contained is the really the way that it was able to happen so there is a magic to to doing it that way and i think it's and i love the pressure cooker environment i think it really does you know i think something like green room is a totally different genre but it's the same kind of thing where sure it's it's great if you can find a reason for people to stay in one place mm -hmm. i hate it when you see one of these movies and it there's no reason for them to stay there right but you can tell they're just doing it because that's the formula mm -hmm. um so cool. it's great uh like seven days is a great one that karn sony was in where it's the pandemic and so these two people go on on a date and then they're stuck together for seven days during the pandemic i thought that was like really smartly done mm -hmm. um but you it's tough finding that thing once you get that like oh here's the hook that can keep me in a house right that I can't leave and it makes sense. So no one is going to be like, you know, it feels kind of small, you know, where yeah. it's like, oh no, this actually makes sense. This is a party and it, we're here. So you were alluding to this. It took like, it, it takes years to get a project off the ground. You wrote, you wrote home delivery in 2018, uh, donor party after, before, like no, around I'm that sorry. same time. I wrote home delivery in 2014 2014 and donor party and in 2018. delivery and sorry and donor party i started in 2018 and finished in 2019 okay. and yeah. they both shot in 2022 pretty much back to back you were yeah. you had about two months in between so you go from you know years of trying to get a project off the ground to both of these are going at the same time was basically the same time was that i'm sure that was exciting but was that also just how did you deal with that? Like, I'm gonna have to make two movies this year, right? I next used to, to have each a other. lot of hair. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think that it was it was insane, and it was one of those. You know, someone told me the phrase "champagne problems." Mm -hmm. Like, you want a champagne problem like that? It's true. Um, I so we were fully in prep for. Um, we were fully in prep for home delivery from about mid, like right before Christmas break uh, mm -hmm. or winter holiday in um, 2021. Okay. Like we were casting it, doing all that stuff. Everyone, you know, people were getting hired. We were, we, we were gonna start location mm -hmm. scouting right as soon as, the, as we came back. Um, and I knew that we had donor party lined up, but it, we didn't know when it was gonna be because it was, it was dependent on Mullen's schedule. Mm -hmm. So what happened is uh, home delivery was supposed to go February, like in the beginning of February, then actor availability, it had to shift to, you know, one piece of advice, don't shoot anything during pilot season. <laughs> okay, makes sense. Nobody, everyone, in, in no, no agent wants to commit their talent to a small indie movie. Mm -hmm when they could get on a network show. So what's, like, I, what's so funny is on uh, next week's episode, I, I interview a director who was talking about a movie that he made. And he was like, the actor's one rule was like, yes, let me be in your movie. This will get me out of doing pilot season. So it's so funny that like, it just, it could go either way. I think It can go either way. Yeah. yeah. It's very tough for a casting director to get people on board during cat during pilot season. Mm -hmm. So we had, we had a push to the beginning of March. And about three weeks out, so like early February, we found out that Malin had an opening in her schedule in May. Mm -hmm. And she had a hard out on June 1st where she was going to go to Sweden to, um, to, to shoot a movie in, Swe in Swedish. And, sure. um, and so it was like the decision was, okay, we don't know when we're going to next have that 
window. Let's mm -hmm. just do it. So literally I sh was prepping. I would get things from the casting director while I was on set for, you know, I, I'm on set on home delivery. I'm getting stuff for a donor party sent to me and I'm mm -hmm. looking at texts and, you know, like, uh, yeah, that's great. I, I like that person <laughs> or, yeah. you know, whatever, like, um, that costume is, is interesting. Let's, you know, whatever, like it was, I had to put it into a little thing and try not to let it get into my head on the other stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, then April, cause that was a 16 day shoot home delivery was 16 days. Okay. Um, and then in April I edited home delivery at night while I prepped all day long, mm -hmm. hard prep for donor party. Then I stopped editing and we pushed pause on the whole edit until after uh, donor party finished, which was, it was a 15 day shoot in May. So mm -hmm. three weeks. And then, and we had, and we literally finished Malin. She was like, can we shoot my scene? She's in almost every single scene. Right. Um, there's one scene that she wasn't in and uh, it toward the end of the schedule. She's like, can we do that as the last scene so that I can wrap out early because I got to get on a plane to go to Sweden for my fitting tomorrow. Right. So that's how <laughs> tight it was. Yeah. Um, and we and and then in June, I would I walked into the donor party edit because I only had four weeks to edit that. Um, and I walked in at 9 30 in the morning. I left at 5 30, drove across town, went into my home delivery edit where it was like we were closer to the end mm -hmm. so june was that and then it Jeez. was like post july was soundtrack and mixing and blah blah and like it went hello this is my cat um <laughs> i went all the it went all the way till like the second week of october when they were both done almost at the exact same time wild it was um, insane yeah when can we expect because home delivery so home delivery was the first movie you directed but I guess technically now Donor Party is your directorial debut because it came out first. Yes. Uh, when when can we expect uh, Home Delivery? Do we have soon. a date or soon? We don't have a date, but okay. soon. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's, I don't want to, I don't want, I do want to get into talking more specifically about Donor Party, which is yes, out, of course. which is out now uh, in, I think, select theaters and also on VOD. Um, obviously the movie, the, so just to, to do a quick summary, Malin Ackerman, her character has recently gotten divorced and she runs into her ex-husband who now has a baby and another on the way. And she realizes that time is running out for her to have kids. And she and her friends come up with a crazy plot to get her pregnant. Where did this idea come from? Well, you'll, you'll relate um, because it came from doing generals and having meetings with development execs mm -hmm, who sure. are all women in their 30s for the most part mm -hmm. um and you know brilliant funny uh fun to be with uh wonderful women and they were all saying how miserable it is to date in la and sure. how they were having a really hard time and their biological clock as much as they don't want to admit it is like knocking on the door and mm -hmm. and i kind of flippantly once i said well you know you don't i, I think the other thing is because I wear this ring, I'm, I'm a pretty safe guy. And I've sure. always been around like I, I was an asthmatic kid. So mm -hmm. I didn't play any sports. And I ended up hanging out with the girls on the sidelines and did student government, which was mostly like I was thinking about this, it was almost all women and then some gay guys and me. But the gay guys were in the closet at the time, like, and I hope I'm not well, they, they're all out anyway, at this point. <laughs> but it was very, you know, it was my life has been surrounded by a lot of women. And I think I just mm -hmm. have that, you know, I overshare and then people overshare back. So when I say, you know, when they were saying this, I just was kind of flippantly saying, well, you know, you don't really have to have a husband to get a baby. And this one, when I said it to this woman, she's like, like that, you know, his yeah, master's like voice her, thing, yeah. like the dog, like, <laughs> ah, Ah, her whole she's world like, opened up like, in that no, moment. No, no, no. I mean, yeah. <laughs> but, but it was like that moment. I was like, that's, and, and when that happened, I was like, that's actually a fun mm -hmm. idea because mm -hmm. it was something where it just felt like that. I So I went home mm -hmm. and I put it in the back of my mind. And then I woke up relatively quickly after that and wrote down on my whiteboard, 
a heist movie, but they steal sperm. Right. And like, literally that was on my whiteboard. That's all it was. <laughs> and it was, um, and then I don't know how your process is, but I, I sort of feel like it's like, you know, when you stick a magnet in the ground and you, you pull it out and you, you move it all around and, and then you get all of this weird stuff that you never saw on the surface mm -hmm. attached to it. And I feel like that's the way that it's not like the whole movie came to me like that. Once I had a really strong magnet, it came faster than a lot of movies, mm -hmm. but it was like, I, I also use simple note and a lot of people use Evernote. Um, and I'll write little bits of dialogue and, and tag it as like, dialogue or tag it as like character or movie title or whatever mm -hmm. and and i was looking through that stuff and and noticing how many things could sort of fit into that story and i and i also realized i could have a story that that talked about kind of all the different ways that we define family mm -hmm. um you know my mom was you know my folks split because my dad's gay and um so I was, you know, my mom and my brother and I were kind of the beard because at the time it wasn't sure. acceptable. So sure, totally. And I and I don't begrudge him at all. And I'm obviously I'm grateful to be here, but there's a really weird part of my backstory that's like, I probably shouldn't exist in that <laughs> weird way. Yeah. And in a and so I those kinds of questions come, I, I find them interesting. And mm -hmm. and I so I as I looked at it, I was like, well. A dinner party also, or a cocktail party has this, you have a lot of facile conversation with people and like, oh, you know, what do you do? Blah, 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 blah. And I knew that I could have our main character interact with a lot of different people. And by doing that, get a lot of different views on what family is mm -hmm. that I wanted to interact, have her interact with and react to um, and do it in a believable way. Cause it's just tough when you have you, you don't want to say, hi, my brother, Jed. Sure. You know, it's yeah. good to see you. Have you seen our mother? Right. Mary, who will be in the next scene? You know, like, it, it's just, you, those are the horrible, horrible scenes to write. So anytime that you can have new characters come in, they give you an opportunity to kind of regurgitate something mm -hmm. else about, you know, that you can get some exposition out in a very natural way. Yeah. Um, or backstory out in a very natural way. So that they all kind of coalesced in this idea. And I realized, oh, that would give me the opportunity to kind of deal with all those things and still have a lot of fun mm -hmm. with some, you know, like Blake Edwards-y style going in one door while someone else is coming out another door and that kind of stuff. It's a very, it's a, it's very funny. It's very, um, I would say it's like a raunchy kind of sex comedy a little bit that we don't have a ton of these days. Uh, was that something that, you know, you were excited to like a genre to like, I want to bring this back a little bit or play in that world that we don't really see that much these days. I, I love those movies. And I also, I, I think that, you know, look, you can say there's two types of movies. There's two types of stories. There's the stories where, you know, there's a protagonist and something who does something horrible and something horrible happens as a result. Mm -hmm. And there's the you know, and so there's the tragedies of that nature. And then there's the ones where, you know, people, you talk about relationships and and that's what comedies are. Comedies mm -hmm. are always about relation. And I think ultimately all movies are about relationships. Even horror sure. movies are really about Absolutely. relationships. So I guess, you know, when you look at Shakespeare, either everyone dies or everyone gets married at the end. Like right. I tend to gravitate towards the everyone gets married at the end, not, sure. not the merry part, but that's right. I love the happy the ending. Right, right. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I don't, it's not like I wanted to make Three's Company or anything like that. Sure. But, but there's a part of that thing of, I just knew I could throw things, I can make things go wrong mm -hmm. in, in a fun way and, and have it, and have it reveal stuff. Like, I really wanted to have the the scene with Molly accidentally taking Molly because right. hearing that that's Molly's, you know, the, 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 the name messes things up. And she's like, oh, okay, this is my drink, as opposed to that's the drink with Molly in it. That's right, right, right. She, she drinks the Molly. 
and yes, it's hilarious. And Aaron Hayes is wonderful. I wanted to mention that. Like I was gonna, we're running, we're lower on time than I wanted. But Aaron Hayes is so funny in this movie. So she, funny. She's great in a lot of stuff. But she, she, I, to me, as great as the movie, like the cast is full of great people doing well. Aaron Hayes walks away with it for me. She's so yeah. funny in it. She's so funny in it, and and she's just so. But what I wanted was, and she ate that whole thing up. But she also wanted to do it for the pool scene. Mm -hmm. because that's where it gets you know the molly kind of unlocks the ability for her to to get real right with with what her life is like and and it was important for me to have those types of moments in there too um mm -hmm. I, the pool ended up being a reflective thing which was you know you know the the colors all that kind of stuff i i wanted the i wanted to slow down a little from the manic pace mm -hmm. and have those those moments at the pool side that were really deep moments um and and heartfelt moments uh but yeah that's to me that was the uh, it, it's the comedy is is important but it's also it's got to serve character and mm -hmm. and so the comedy that does serve character great and if it's but if i can get people to laugh and then bring something else in then that's you know perfect yeah and i think and i think um Malin's got a t like it's a it can be a tricky part the this lead because it is you know, if if someone was doing this sperm heist in the real world, trying to, you know, get pregnant from unsuspecting guys, like, there's some questionable moral oh, things 100%. to that. Uh, but it is a movie, and it is, and we have, but we have to buy that this, you know, we still have to like this character. And I think the writing, for one, and also just Mom's performance of being able to be vulnerable and be funny and do, uh, you know, bad things and still be likable, uh, it was a real... Like yeah, she she served the movie very well. What was it like working with her on that? She was she was wonderful, and and honestly, she was the reason. Casting when we were coming up with a list of people, there's the list that they you know, and word to the wise, if you start working with a producer who wants to get this seen by a lot of people, they're going to look at like who can sell the movie, and I get yep. that, I understand that. Um, but when you also are thinking about that list, you have to think about who has the, who can do the whole picture, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of people who, who were on a list that I was like, okay, well, you're funny, but I don't know if you can do this other thing or you're funny, but ugh, in a way that I think will push people away. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't want to name names, but you know, sure. there are some people who are just, who, who are hilarious, um, but would not have the warmth to get people mm -hmm. on board or who couldn't do the humor like mm -hmm. that's the other side of it she is so so good and i remember seeing her in heartbreak kid and mm -hmm. just thinking that she was brilliant because she she has this she goes all the way and she commits so hard to that and it's wonderful but the the show that really nailed it for me was uh trophy wife i love is, trophy wife it's it not so good it was so funny it's so funny and so it, it it's very it's sweet. Just, yeah. It's sweet, it's nuanced, it's a lot of the stuff that I knew I wanted. So I was always like, it's Malin. It's gotta be Malin. We gotta mm -hmm. do money. like and I wrote this letter that was like, listen, <laughs> I just put it all out in this letter. <laughs> um, and she took a meeting and we spent and it was like within five minutes, we were on the same page, wanted to do the same thing. We knew it was the right call. And she had faith in me um, mm -hmm. and faith in the material and faith in herself that she could do it. Cause she's, like I said, literally in every scene, but two, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's all on her back. If, mm -hmm. if, if she doesn't work, the movie doesn't work. So I just am, I'm so grateful. And then she opened up her Rolodex and invited so many of her friends and, you know, working with her and working with, uh, our casting director, Anthony Krauss, it was like, I couldn't believe the people who we yeah. got. Donor Party is out now. Uh, is there anything else that you want to plug or tell people where they can follow? You've got, we've got less than a minute left. This thing is flown. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm, you know, it's my name at Twitter until it explodes and, uh, <laughs> and Instagram. It's T-H-O-M because I was a pretentious fifth grader. <laughs> So. I still have a middle initial in my writing name, so I, I totally get I totally get being pretentious. With our little bit of remaining time, uh, when I get to know you on an even deeper level, Tom, um, what is the meaning of life for you? 
Connection. I mean, honestly, that's, it's connecting with people. Um, if there's no connection, then we don't, I, I honestly feel like that's why we have language is because we're not meant to be alone. Mm. Uh, we were designed to be with another person and, uh, and be in conversation and, and get messy. Your meeting has ended. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to 39 Minute Conversations, hosted and produced by Brian T. Arnold. Music by Kevin McLeod, licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0 license. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and tune in for new episodes, and don't forget to rate and review. If you didn't like what you heard, please don't do any of that. That's okay, too. Thank you, and we'll see you next time. Stay safe and be well.